Hello, everybody. This is Chris Madrid French, and I'm with California Preservation Foundation, Director of Development, and welcome to our book club. My colleague John is on vacation this week. Hey, John, if you're out there, uh, he's on some adventure. Uh, he'll be back soon for our December programs. So if you were watching our pre-roll, you'll see that we have a set of four programs coming up for December. We call those our winter warmers, and you are not going to want to miss them, including a gingerbread house house uh, contest where you can make a gingerbread house and send us a picture and we'll we'll be featuring that at one of our happy hours uh, in December. So make sure you go to our website, californiapreservation.org, and you'll see all that information. Every program is free, and we do hope that you feel like donating to CPF this December. It's your donations that help us keep all of our programs or most of our programs free so that everybody in the community can participate. And it means so much to us uh, when we see your names up in our list. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone today. So I have a lot going on. I'm going to be monitoring the Facebook chat and the chat on Zoom. Uh, so pardon me if I'm a little bit behind on one or two of our things. We will be using the Q&A uh, box. for So if you do have a question, you can post that in the Q&A. Uh, and I will be getting to those towards the end of the program. If you'd like, since I'm watching so many windows right now, if anyone wants to post in the chat, where you're calling in from, and then I can start uh, seeing some of my friends and colleagues up in there, uh, which always makes my day even more special. Well, I wanted to introduce Allison. I'm just gonna pull up my uh, information. This is really a great privilege and a pleasure to introduce Allison. She is a person who has written a, a book. I'm gonna talk a little bit about her book if I can find my notes real quick. Uh, pardon me one second. So um, her book is uh, Living the California Dream, African-American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era. It's from the University of Nebraska Press. It was honored with the 2020 Miriam Matthews Ethnic History Award by the Los Angeles City Historical Society for its exceptional contributions to the greater understanding and awareness of regional history. I just finished reading the book recently, and I feel it's such a powerful piece on a lot of the issues that we're dealing with, with today, for sure. Um, you can get a discount code for the book. I encourage you to buy a copy. If you go to our website at californiapreservation.org, you'll see that information. Uh, Allison is on the front page today, so you just click there and you'll see all the information. So I'd like to introduce Allison. Uh, Dr. Allison Rose Jefferson is a historian, heritage conservation consultant, and a third generation Californian. Currently, she is a Getty Conservation Institute fellow where she's continuing her research on the historical African-American experiences and public policies to conserve it in the California coastal zone in Venice, California. You can visit her website at Allison Rose Jefferson Dot com to learn more about her work and her applied history projects that she's also completed, drawing on her research of Southern California locales, which feature historical significance, as well as contemporary consequences while elucidating the historical African-American experience. So Allison, welcome. <laughs> And hello, everyone. Hello, uh, Christine. And thank you to the California Preservation Foundation for inviting me to share with you all today. And I'm just going to put up my slides. And I'm standing because it's easier for me to do my talk uh, uh, about the book this way. It makes me more comfortable. So today I'm going to um, share a little bit about uh, my book, uh, Living the California Dream, African-American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era. Uh, and I'm looking at sites that are intangible and tangible. And these stories are of um, Black people who made California and American history by challenging racial and class hierarchies when they claimed space in California from colonial times uh, to their occupation and claiming of um, public recreation space at the core of the state's formative 20th century identity. These places, 
<clears throat> these places became sites of resistance in the development of attractive inland resorts and beaches relatively free from white citizens harassment. In Los Angeles, recreation and relaxation were an essential component, were an essential component of liberty and contested ground in the struggle for freedom. African Americans began moving uh, in large numbers to the Los Angeles environs in the decades surrounding the turn of the 20th century, joining a multi-ethnic community that included whites and people of color, as well as immigrants <clears throat> of many national backgrounds. The majority of new black migrants relocated from American Southern states. Their stories uh, are about public and private memories of African Americans of all socioeconomic classes. The new Negro who migrated to uh, United States Northern, Midwestern and far Western parts in the post-World War I decades to escape the worst of Jim Crow racism, anti-Black restrictions and racial violence. violence. These migrants were much more self-confident and sometimes militant in demanding uh, their rights as citizens and as consumers. Similar to other uh, groups who moved to the state, African-Americans embraced the booster, promoted a California dream of a leisure lifestyle and uh, as a permanent way of life in picturesque outdoor settings, even while discrimination and, uh, uh, and the, in picturesque outdoor settings and a mild climate uh, and uh, new life opportunities, even while they were embracing all these things, even while uh, discrimination and lax enforcement of uh, uh, California civil rights laws established as early as 1893, many times prevented them from using various public and private facilities and buying land in many areas for decades into the 20th century. Despite uh, the challenges, African Americans actively participated in uh, the Calif in, in California's development uh, through, uh, throughout the early 20th century Great Migration. They bought homes and other property, raised families, launched businesses, created social and faith institutions, and nurtured a rich cultural milieu that included the emergence of West Coast jazz. So in my book, I offer a view of the overlooked extraordinary community builders and socioeconomic development experiences of black people of all classes in Los Angeles and California and the impact uh, 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 of leisure that uh, intersects with the new scholarship about the influence of the diverse output of the Harlem Renaissance and the new Negro experience as a cultural uh, movement of national and global phenomena. These stories of unrecognized voices, economic development initiatives, and civil rights struggles add new information <coughs> and understanding about how African Americans sought to seize their California and American dream to uh, appropriate and shape the offerings of their new environment in the far West. These stories that I have reconstructed through uh, site visit and other research recapture and recast the significance, meaning, and place of leisure by recognizing African Americans agency, leadership and action, thereby, uh, therefore uh, uh, giving a more complex understanding of the American experience and identity in the West and California where racial discrimination existed in practice rather than legal uh, prescription as in many other states of the nation in the post enslavement modern capitalist era. In contrast to the city where 
uh, Black Angelinos lived, California waterfront and inland pastoral places where they went to relax and invested in real estate included in Los Angeles County, Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach, which a few of you may have paid attention to the stories in the news about recently, Santa Monica's uh, South Beach neighborhoods near uh, uh, the Bay Street Beach, which was sometimes controversially called the Inkwell, Eureka Villa in Santa, uh, Santa Clarita Valley. In Riverside uh, County, Lake Elsinore <clears throat> and Corona's Park Ridge Country Club and a few other places uh, are uh, examined in my book. I'm also gonna talk today a little bit um, about how um, the histories of some of these places are um, shaping uh, contemporary initiatives. So these stories of California's largest and most popular, though not broadly remembered African-American relaxation des destinations were places of pleasure, identity, uh, challenge to racist anti-Black uh, 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 private practices and public policies and sites of economic development that flourished uh, for different time durations between the 1900s to the 1960s. Race, power, privilege, and wealth often influence and uh, uh, often influence and restricted uh, leisure opportunities, just as these factors determined who was able to take advantage of economic and social opportunities in Southern California. Even with these impacts, African-Americans in their building and enjoyment of these leisure communities through creative assertion claimed and performed full humanity, civic membership, as well as uh, social and economic, uh, uh, as well as social and economic uh, development resourcefulness and self-determination. This history is layered with, uh, <laughs> with stories about uh, group and individual circumstances and chronicles about migration patterns, socioeconomic status, cultural practices, and education and employment opportunities and social power. These multifaceted, intersecting, and overlapping experiences and stories took place in private and public spaces. They are inseparable from one another in their composition and reflection of structural racial exclusion and class exploitation imposed on African Americans and other marginalized groups of color. In their pursuit, of emotional and physical rejuvenation uh, and unwillingness to accept exclusion, like their counterparts around uh, the US, Black Angelinos developed separate leisure spaces against oppressive racial subjugation of the era to promote, uh, to promote a renewed sense of racial pride, cultural self uh, expression, <clears throat> economic independence, progressive politics, and progressive politics, politics that were the embodiment of the new Negro determined to achieve a fuller participation in American society. The experiences and memories of these leisure spaces and destinations and the attention they gained in public memory and newspapers of the era offered African-Americans new and broader visions of themselves, a new identity and a new collective sense of freedom contributing to cultural and intellectual efforts that defined the new Negro. Black Angelinos and Southern Californians in their ambitions and initiatives challenged the era's white supremacist conventions um, <coughs> Uh, uh, about social space and place as they asserted self-determination to participate in popular uh, leisure and resort cultural 
social and economic trends that were considered modern by the 1920s. In ex-urban communities, African-Americans bought property so they could control their enjoyment of these activities and contest anti-Black racism. Particularly, they were challenging the power of whites <clears throat> to, in labeling of African-Americans as laborers and as inferior. African-Americans radically claimed, challenged, and promoted the state's identity in the consumption of the state's outdoor offerings as a lifestyle. They, like white residents, helped to promote the California dream lifestyle that would spread across the country to develop a new suburban middle-class culture, which became a forceful marker on Americans, uh, a forceful marker of American citizenship identi and identity generally. Each site uh, discussed in the book has its own history of development of a specific sort of leisure with its own set of social, political, and economic particulars, as well as racialized issues of uh, the time and place. These and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, these and other leisure spaces <coughs> excuse me, These and other leisure spaces marked an African-American identity on the Southern California landscape and social spaces as they confronted the emergent power politics of leisure space. These sites emerged as places for remembrance of invention and public contest. One of the earliest places uh, African Americans visited for rejuvenation was Lake Elsinore in Riverside County, a somewhat successful residential and leisure destination for the general population and uh, African Americans through the middle decades of the 20th century. This was one of the furthest inland African American leisure spaces. The vagaries of lake conditions uh, and changing leisure tastes and race relation dynamics over the years impacted African-American entrepreneurs, resort business uh, opportunities and success. The African-American presence has been left out of uh, local history narratives and landmark designation programming. This omission obstructs our understanding of the full shared collective history of the range of community builders and their impact and contributions to the development of Lake Elsinore and the Southern California region. The city of Corona's Park Ridge Country Club in Riverside was a private elite club and leisure space originally built for a white only clientele. A group of very ambitious African-American businessmen, Jeune W. White, physician Eugene C. Nelson, and Clarence R. Bailey purchased the site to operate as an interracial space and an attempt at Black community suburbanization and elite recreation in 1927. The local elite and other white racist uh, citizens strongly contested the African-American uh, reconstruction of this Corona community venture. The African-American businessmen's efforts to make the venture a success have been left out of the local history narrative, thereby again limiting our understanding of the Corona communities and Southern California's historical actors and evolution. Eureka Villa, later known as Valverde, in, in Northwest Los Angeles County was initially an African-American planned resort community development project 
with white American partners that began in 1924. An early leader of this project was Black Angelino real estate impresario and booster, Sidney P. Domes. Public money contributed to the development of uh, a park and swimming pool and multiple marketing efforts by boosters, both black and white, helped sustain interest of African-American consumers um, usage of this hidden canyon area until the crumbling of racial apartheid in the 1960s. In recent years, the Val Verde community has been recast as one of the last rural areas remaining with affordable housing in Santa Clarita, in Santa Clarita Valley with limited public memory of the African-American heritage. Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach, a Pacific Rim community in southwestern Los Angeles County, which has been in the news uh, lately, was uh, an early successful African-American residential resort community and day trip leisure destination, which began in 1912. Eventually, racial exclusionary measures aided by destructive use of state power in 1924, eliminated their residential and social, residential, social and economic development with attempts to erase the site's memory from history. Only through political assertion has a limited uh, revival of the history of Bruce's Beach and its incorporation into the public record emerged in the first decades of the 21st century. Um, so in the book, I also uh, discuss similar cases uh, to exclude African-Americans that occurred at other California beach towns in the 1920s. African-Americans were able to build a sustained community in the city of Santa Monica, founded, uh, which was founded in the 1880s, a few blocks from the Pacific shoreline in the environs of what is today the Civic Center and Phillips Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, the first African-American institution established in the city uh, in 1906. A short way south uh, was a Venice neighborhood, a Venice neighborhood which was considered part of uh, this Santa Monica African-American community. Through, throughout the early 20th century, uh, Afri African-American regional residents in Los Angeles, uh, entrepreneurs attempting leisure space service, uh, <clears throat> attempting leisure, sa leisure space service uh, business expansion for blacks was challenged by various racial exclusionary uh, measures inhibiting racial uh, inhibiting residential expansion and economic development. Um, uh, but African-American citizens, public beach usage and a small local residential uh, uh, community persisted in spite of uh, the economic sabotage that occurred. The local African-American community's persistence uh, in Santa Monica has mattered in the reclamation of place and memory in the 21st century heritage conservation efforts and public history programming uh, that um, have been initiated by public officials and citizens groups. This programming in contemporary times, uh, such as uh, Nick Gavaldon Day, uh, uh, International Coastal Cleanup Day, uh, field trips for youngsters from South Los Angeles, and the Belmar History Plus Art Project, which uh, we're finishing rolling out uh, now, actively uh, connects diverse publics to more complex, culturally inclusive stories of our collective national history, heritage conservation issues, beach wildlife appreciation, and watershed stewardship as well as aspirations to environmental justice policies involving beach access issues and social uh, action intersecting with beach recreation. Uh, 
Some of these programming uh, efforts uh, include introductory surfing lessons as part of the beach uh, uh, recreation activities. So fast forward uh, to 2019, fast forward to 2019, in part due to uh, my knowledge production and support of uh, public uh, programming, uh, Santa Monica's, uh, uh, and support of public programming at Santa Monica's African American uh, beach site, uh, this, this area was listed in 2019 uh, on uh, the National Register as the Bay Street Beach Historic District for its significance in the Black experience and U.S. history. This is the first historic district in Santa Monica to receive this national honor. And it's one of the few in California and the nation associated with African-Americans and other marginalized groups. So fast forwarding again to 2020, uh, uh, the Bay Street Beach uh, in Santa Monica and uh, Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach became sites of consciousness reflection and healing for memorial and celebratory events uh, at this time of uh, national and global protests for racial justice. These events were held to show solidarity with, uh, the, with protests against uh, systemic anti-Black racism and police brutality, which the Black Lives Matter movement uh, uh, has forced prominently onto the national and global agenda as part of a reclamation of and commitment to uh, the, the Black freedom struggle. Joining the current movement of racial reckoning, Manhattan Beach residents have proposed new interpretive panels and artwork on the Bruce's Beach Park site the city owns to tell the story in a fuller fashion. The current Manhattan Beach City Council recently uh, formally acknowledged and condoned their predecessor's racist land grab to force the Bruce and other and, and several other uh, black families out of the area, but stopped short of formally apologizing. Meanwhile, uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed Senate Bill 796 to allow uh, Los Angeles County supervisors to return the beachfront property they own to, this, to the descendants of Charles and Willa Bruce, uh, from whom it was, uh, it was uh, wrongfully taken in the 1920s. This proposed land uh, give back is an example of what reparations and restitution could look like in California and across the nation in some situations. State and uh, uh, Los Angeles County leaders have now opened new ways, uh, have now opened up new ways of thinking uh, about how to redress and commemorate social injustices that have, uh, uh, have not been looked at in the past. These moves are a good thing, but we must think more deeply about the events of 100 years ago and their legacy. This uh, restitution will not provide tangible benefits to the purged African-Americans of all classes from Manhattan Beach that lost out on uh, a vibrant socioeconomic cultural space where today they make up less than half a percentage of the city's, a uh, half a percentage point of the city's 35,000 population. For broader benefits uh, to occur, our elected officials need to develop socioeconomic pro, uh, public programs that encourage African-American community opportunities in Manhattan Beach and other coastal beaches. 
Like many white Americans, Black Americans were lured to California for its opportunities and the good life imagery produced by writers, painters, photographers, and movie makers, which were used by various boosters promoting migration to the state. The stories and imagery of African Americans who participated in various phases of the Western migration and settlement continue to remain largely absent from the dominant mythologies and history surrounding uh, the Western migration, notwithstanding investigation of the Black West published during the last 60 years. So today I've briefly highlighted little known stories about African-American leadership and socioeconomic investment in uh, the California dream lifestyle uh, 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 places, uh, uh, in the California dream lifestyle at places that uh, have been called frontier of leisure destinations in Southern California uh, from the 1900s to the 1960s. And a few ways this history is being reclaimed and amplified now. We, as citizens, activists, heritage conservation professionals, and elected officials have to continue to find ways to recognize marginalized groups and their heritage through our intentional actions of inclusiveness and diversity for social justice, and not uh, talking points for the appearance of political correctness. These actions of commemorative, environmental, and social justice and knowledge production, I have described, recognize that African Americans have a right to historical and cultural sites, a place in the American identity, and the joys of cultural expression and self-fulfillment, along with clean air, clean water, and enjoyment of all of America's resources. I hope that you uh, uh, will all take time to learn a bit more about these forgotten Black Western pioneers, their undertakings, and how these stories impact our lives today by uh, picking up my book, Living the California Dream, African American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to have the conversation with you about your thoughts on the book. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson. That was a, such a compelling uh, conversation. And as I mentioned earlier, your book was uh, to me very powerful to read. Uh, I'm a native of Los Angeles. I'm sure everybody knows that by now, but I'm a native of Los Angeles and so much of this history has, has not been revealed. There was a quote I wanted to read where I think kind of summarizes your, your work says, African-American people and their history are obscured if there is no understanding of their embrace of life in all its complexity, including how they enjoyed their free time at recreation and leisure destinations of their creation. Uh, I wanted to find out, maybe start at the beginning, how did you get inspired to follow this, this uh, research track in, in that you, you've spent so many years on? So when I was working on a master's degree uh, at USC uh, in heritage conservation, I was looking around for paper topics and I wanted to write about something that interested me. And um, I remembered Lake Elsinore as someplace that my mom's family used to go when uh, she was growing up. And I had heard stories about the experience of her going there. And when I was a kid, they, um, we had one really big family outing where we went up there when the lake was refurbished. And so I had presented some ideas for paper topics to uh, Kevin Starr, who many of you know, the late, uh, the late Kevin Starr was at one point the California um, librarian uh, and he was teaching at USC and he, uh, 
he, 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 I, this was a paper topic I presented and he was like, oh, that's what you should write on. Not the, I was thinking about writing about the mission in and, and, and the hoteler uh, of that time period, comparing him to hotelers of contemporary times and how he was doing innovative things in a hotel. And so uh, Kevin just encouraged me Dr. Starr encouraged me to, you know, look at this history that I was really interested in. And that's how I got started. Um, I didn't know that I was going to continue on to get a PhD. I, I just was trying to uh, figure out things to think about in terms of regional history that I was interested in and that in some ways hadn't been covered before because the angle that I was even looking at in terms of Frank Miller and the, uh, uh, and the Mission Inn, it was an angle nobody had looked at, but, <laughs> you know, but it worked out. And I, at that time, I then learned about, I knew a little bit about Valverde, uh, not from a personal experience, just from reading about it. I didn't know about this country club in, um, in Corona, but I learned about it based on doing my reading for uh, uh, on um, uh, based on doing my reading on Lake Elsinore, and then I learned about the beach areas too. I didn't really know about the beach areas, uh, so it was a process of uh, research that uh, led to the unfolding of more research. That, that's very interesting. We, I'm going to pull in a couple of questions here and there from the Q&A box. Uh, someone was also, uh, Janet says, she's curious about your research. What was especially challenging in your research for this topic? And what surprised you the most? So in terms of uh, the research, because I don't really know <laughs> what I was getting into, the sources are really thin in terms of the archives. And that's something that um, uh, is across the board in terms of a lot of um, uh, uh, exploration of African American history, as well as other groups who have been marginalized. And so just kind of understanding how to find the material was. Um, really um, uh, a challenge. And because I'm a native Angelino, I had one advantage from the standpoint that I could consult elders who had these experiences. And then that was the way I found a lot of material to validate the stories. And um, in terms of coming to this research, had I maybe started in another way, if I had started from a PhD standpoint and was totally trained in the mythologies of the archives, I might not have been as open to all these ways to generate uh, the material that I needed as the foundation for, uh, 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 for this research. So it was by any means met necessary, but, but I mean, you know, going to the archive sources, there's not a lot. It's piecing together. Okay, you find a little bit of stuff here in this newspaper. You find a little bit over in this archive at the AAA because they have road condition stuff and a few maps. You go over to the uh, 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 LA County Natural History Museum library and they have some regional history files and they may have one or two pieces. You get lucky, you go and interview somebody and they have a photo album full of their family and friends experiences at one of these places. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's talk about that for a second. I've heard from other people. Um, so if I was researching my families from Boyle Heights and even trying to find the information like you're talking about, it's almost like you're excluded even from documenting your own history when you try to go back and find that. And I've talked to a filmmaker here in Atlanta, you know, up, up the, I'm in Orlando, right? So up the road here in Atlanta. Uh, and he's talked about when he tried to make a documentary how the even the price of uh, licensing the material he was trying to get, which tells his own story as as an African American in Atlanta, that he couldn't afford. He said they're they're keeping my own history hostage, and I think what you're saying with the with the methodologies of the archives, not everyone is familiar with that. It's you know some of these archives are very complicated to get into. Um, I wanted to ask, a, a lot of people have questions about Bruce's Beach, like I, as I was equally uh, captivated by that conversation. And you do cover it extensively in your book. So there's three or four questions about it. So I think we should talk about that next. Um, so the Bruce's Beach story I found compelling because I was just telling you, uh, Dr. Jefferson, that I was living in Manhattan Beach for six months uh, before, um, I'm, I, before COVID. And I was not even aware of this history. It is just really not revealed. And uh, you did say something in your book that there is, let me find this great quote that you said. Oh, when we don't recognize these sites, it's a double dose of erasure or loss. So when we fail to protect these sites and recognize these sites, you're, what, how would you explain when you wrote that? What was, what was behind all that? Well, we, don't understand who we are as regional citizens. We don't understand the contributions of all the partners that were involved in making this place what it is today. And that's, uh, that's the things that were positive and the things that were negative as well. In terms of Manhattan Beach, we can look at Manhattan Beach today and see why it's all white because they pushed out all the black people in the 1920s. Well, in pushing out all the black people in the 1920s, that and also minimizing what other people of marginalized heritage might live there, that pushed out a whole lot of intellectual and cultural power that might have been able to contribute to the city's development in a uh, productive manner. I, well, I agree. I think so. And so um, Bruce's Beaches, you had in your last slide or one of the last slides of the pink square. What is the what's the status of that uh, that effort to return that property to the descendants of the Bruce family? So um, Cal uh, Governor Newsom uh, has signed the bill SB 96 so that the county can give the land back uh, after they figure out how they're going to do that. They're verifying who the uh, descendants are of, of Charles and Willa Bruce. And then they have to figure out what's the best way to give the land back. Because even in giving the land back, there's a lot of things that go along with taxes and what are they going to do with the lifeguard uh, training center that's there. Um, there's zoning issues in terms of what can and cannot be done with the land. So they have to work it out with the family to come up with the best solution uh, to meet everyone's needs. And in case that anyone, you know, we get people from all over the country watching these programs. And so if you're not familiar with Manhattan Beach, as you can imagine, that property is now worth millions and millions of dollars. Is that right, Dr. Jefferson? I, I would imagine, I know houses right there go for about, you know, between six and $10 million right there on that walk. So the property is very expensive at this point. Yes. And do um, uh, Wayne uh, Donaldson had a question. Do you feel that the return of Bruce's Beach will also help other marginalized communities get their properties back? And he said, excellent presentation. Um, hi there, Wayne. So, you know, that the, the, the situation in Manhattan Beach is very specific. And so I think that it opens up uh, ways for us to continue to think creatively about 
restorative justice ideas. Um, everybody isn't having a problem getting their land back, um, but everybody's having a problem being able to access the beach. <laughs> um, so I, I think that, that you know, we have to, to think about this as one way to, to help this particular situation. We get a psychological benefit. Everybody gets a psychological benefit because this is something that is um, um, you know, healing for this particular family and for the community in general, but it's not providing, as I said in my talk, uh, you know, my remarks, there's not any tangible benefits for you or I with this land give back. And we're not, you know, providing anything for the socioeconomic cultural space that African Americans lost over the last hundred years by being kicked out of that place. Right. There's not any reparations for what could have been a long term economic situation there. Right. Yes. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we it's a wonderful thing. And maybe there are some other situations uh, like the Bruce's situation where they uh, where giving the land back to a particular family can be uh, the answer. We think about also the black farmers around the nation that have lost their land due to various kinds of uh, uh, federal government program mismanagement. You know, there's been several articles about that over the years and the black folks haven't been able to get that land back yet. And they're still fighting in terms of particular court cases. Well, and how about then, you know, some people might say, well, what, you know, you know, how people want to go that next step. Well, then how about all the land that was taken uh, for highways and roads? I just saw something here in Florida where the, the governor, we won't go into that, but the governor said that there is no uh, systemic uh, racism in terms of the way federal highways were erected, which we know is incorrect from many scholars have been studying this for a, a number of years. So how would you address if somebody um, had that? kind of a criticism. I think you've already kind of said that it's, this is a very specific case and very specific um, occasion. Yeah. You know, the, the freeways, as it relates to the freeways, you know, freeways are a public infrastructure. And at this point in time, we've recognized the injustice of how the pathways were selected for them. And so hopefully in the future, we won't do that. And in Santa Monica, uh, they have decided, for instance, some of those people that were displaced with the freeway and their descendants, that with the uh, new affordable housing that they have there, that they will be able to, if they want to rent a place in one of these places, they'll be given extra points uh, on the list because they're descendants of these people who were displaced. Mm -hmm. So there are things that people are thinking about doing. Um, it's a start. <laughs> Right. It's a start. Um, let me get to some more of these questions. There are a lot of questions. Um, so um, another question about Bruce's Beach. I think you answered this in the book, but did it draw visitors principally from Los Angeles or did it also uh, attract visitors from other areas of the country, such as the Midwest and the East Coast? So um, African-Americans that were going to Bruce's Beach were primarily coming uh, going there from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if somebody was coming out here from back east and they had heard about, you know, the different places that were available, they would be going down there to Bruce's Beach or going to Santa Monica or going to Lake Elsinore. And that brings up uh, the green book. So someone did ask about what information did you uncover that's related to these obstacles to travel? Uh, and for instance, the green book, which you had an illustration of the green book, I believe in your book. Yeah, so the green book um, didn't start until 1936. And it was one of the various guides around the country that provided information about places that would serve African-Americans. and. Um, so 
Lake Elsinore, Val Verde, and um, uh, 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 Santa Monica establishments at different times uh, from the 30s through the 50s were listed in there, not necessarily consistently. And wasn't the, the Green Book was started by a, a post a postman, a mailman? It was, yes. It's Which, an interesting story. It is. You know, I mean, he had a great opportunity to uh, gather information because he had a network already in place of these postal workers around the nation. So they could send him information about the communities where they lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting story that people can look into. Um, here's something just a little different. So uh, Carson asked, are you he, he are um, curious about what African-American recreational sites emerged in Long Beach, which has a long African-American presence dating back at least to the beginning of the 20th century and have any recent historic context research commissioned by Long Beach shed light on African-American leisure sites in that city? There weren't any there uh in the way that Bruce's Beach and um, um, Bay Street Beach in Santa Monica established themselves. And the black population in um, Long Beach really developed a little later in the century. Yeah, there maybe were one, two, three people there early in the 20th century, but it wasn't the same. There was an African, it wasn't in terms of the numbers, it wasn't the same. There was the attempt, which I do talk about in my book to build, uh, uh, to sustain a uh, resort, the Pacific Beach Club in Huntington Beach. And that place was built in the 20s and it had a white partner and it was beautiful from the, um, renderings that we've seen of it and the descriptions and the white people burned it down in 25 in February 25 right before it was supposed to open. So that was an easy shot to get to on the um, the red car um, and what have you. And it was um, uh, that so that was the place on that side of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Diane of Kane in San Diego has recently completed a short article on the small African-American community in La Jolla. She says, we're refurbishing our community re recreation center and would like to commemorate this community that no longer exists. Do you have any suggestions on how to proceed with accurate, appropriate, and sensitive historical interpretation? So I know a little bit about the community, but I don't have details uh, of, you know, I, I don't, know enough about it. I'll be glad to talk to you, Diane, at another time. I can connect you too. Mm -hmm. you know, she knows how to reach me. As okay. well. <laughs> but I mean, you can connect us. I mean, I'll be glad to, you know, learn more about the site. I know that June Edmonds just did a mural down there to commemorate one of the early African-American women who lived there in the community. And it's on, uh, I think it's on a private building. Uh, oh down there, mm -hmm. uh, finished that in the last year. Um, and um, so, yeah, I'd be glad to have a conversation with you about it. You're going to be the, the nationwide expert, uh, Dr. Jefferson, if you're not careful. <laughs> um, did you find any, did you uncover any other properties similar to Bruce's Beach that might lend themselves to being returned to heirs of families in these coastal communities? Or was this really a single? instance? So in Santa Monica, and I don't really talk about this in the book, um, because it was later. Uh, and I, I may have actually learned about it after I had finished the book, I can't remember now. But in the 1950s, Silas, um, Silas White uh, uh, was developing a uh, African-American beach club in Santa Monica uh, where the Viceroy Hotel is today. And it um, was an old Elks Club building. He had a white partner and they were rehabbing the building. And the city in 1957 decided that they take the land through eminent domain to create a parking lot. So this is at the time when the Civic Center is expanding 
they were building, they were getting ready to build the, um, getting ready to build the civic auditorium, the courthouse. They were raising the residential community that include a lot of African-Americans across the street from this site, which wasn't really the Belmar area, but it was, um, which I have done a public history project on and talked about that a little bit in my slides. Um, so that land was taken for this parking lot and there's an article on it uh, that you can find on my website that was written recently and then in my essay on the Belmar history uh, pro uh, for the Belmar history project, I do a deep dive into it, but that land was taken, the city still owns it and they eventually allowed a hotel to be built on that property between Maine and Ocean Boulevard right at um, Pico. And it was a racist land grab because the city still owns the land. It's not solely a parking lot and they lease it to the hotel that's making the city money and this hotel is making money. They could have done that with Silas White in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me, we did, uh, we were talking to um, representatives of the Ohlone tribe up in uh, Berkeley and they've talked about, and there was similar, where well, there was, it was uh, um, a shell mound burial area was made into a parking lot and they're trying to uh, reclaim that and there's resistance. And it just uh, seems like, um, there could be better ways to solve this situation. Uh, we have just a couple more questions, a few minutes left. Um, uh, there's, how would, would you address, we'll just talk about this for a minute. How would you address uh, getting this information out in consideration of, uh, I would just, I'll just call it the current tenor of the discussion regarding um, communities of color and the history that they have. Some people, you mentioned this in your book, that the marking of a place for history can sometimes be too powerful for some. They'd rather um, sustain the shame of the past wrong rather than repairing it by remembering. What would you say about, you know, what's the value really of remembering these sites within that context? So we're made up as a, an American identity of a lot of different stories. And we have to tell all of our stories. We have to tell the stories that um, were ones that some people don't think are the hero narrative, as well as the ones that are. And many of the stories to do with African-American and other marginalized groups are stories of injustice. But that doesn't mean that those stories cannot be stories of triumph, or stories of perseverance, or stories of contestation, which is also part of the American identity. So, um, you know, we can't just have the white guy on the horse uh, 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 as someone that we commemorate in terms of history. That's, that's uh, I think that's a great place for us to to wrap up our conversation, uh, Allison. I don't think I could say anything of, of over that. I'm just glad that um, that a book like yours exists and it's out there, and that your research is get um, is getting the highlighted attention. That's really helping to um, um, show some of these injustices. Uh, these systemic injustices that have, that is, I, one of the things I just wanted to close out with is I can't believe it's taken a hundred years for this to kind of come around because you talk about the Bruce family uh, in, we're in Manhattan Beach in the 1920s. Um, I wanted to thank everybody. We had a couple more questions, but I think we covered uh, most of this book. I would encourage everyone to go and get a copy as soon as possible. Cindy has posted the information at uh, where you can find that in our chat. And Allison, did you want to say any closing words? Um, there's a lot of information in my book and the stories intersect heritage conservation, public history, migration patterns, identity, lots of different things. There's lots of intersectionality in terms of the uh, 
the knowledge that is there. And so I hope that you all will um, take a deep dive into the book. I really appreciate you uh, taking time and sharing your expertise with everyone. Uh, you can see this webinar is recorded and you can share it with your friends on Facebook and it will be posted to our YouTube channel uh, probably in about a week or so when John gets back. Uh, Dr. Jefferson, thank you again for all of your help and your information today. It's, it's been such a powerful conversation. I really appreciate your time. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> And you can learn more about my work at my website, alisonrosejefferson.com. Yes, thank you, Dr. Jefferson. And everybody else, be sure you check our website, californiapreservation.org. We have a whole series of fun and interesting uh, webinars coming up uh, for December. So you don't want to miss any of those. And our annual awesome auction is going to be starting right before Thanksgiving. So visit our website, consider membership, please. And feel free to donate at californiapreservation.org. All right, Dr. Jefferson, we'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.